the most famous historical figures in psychology is Sigmund Freud, who used his psychodynamic theory to explain everything from child development to abnormal psychology to personality, each person's unique patterns of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. While a lot of Freud's theory has been replaced with more modern, research-based approaches, his work is important for its historical contributions and the revolutionary nature of what he proposed. Revolutionary in its suggestion that most mental activity takes place outside of our conscious thought and awareness, that unconscious motivations, and not just conscious ones, influence our thoughts, feelings, and personality. Specifically, he believed that the internal mind was built on three unconscious parts, the id, ego, and superego that are always in conflict with one another. And that it's through this internal conflict, the anxiety it produces and our desires to reduce it, that shape who we are. According to Freud, the first unconscious influence to emerge is the id, which emerges at birth and wants immediate gratification of primitive urges like hunger and thirst. The id is driven by the pleasure principle or the instinctive drive to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Over time and through the influence of parents, the infant develops the second unconscious influence, the superego. Freud described the superego as the part of the mind that acts as the conscious and moral compass. This leads to the development of new emotions, like the ability to feel pride in our accomplishments, but also guilt about our shortcomings. The id and the superego battle it out in the unconscious realm, not unlike the devil and angel on someone's shoulders, until eventually a new unconscious construct emerges to try to bring peace. The ego, or the self, is the rational part of a person as seen by others. The ego is driven by the reality principle, attempting to satisfy the needs of the ids and the idealism of the superego while urging us to adopt behaviors that will work in the real world. In other words, the ego finds the middle path between the id's primal desires and the superego's judgments and guilt. These three aspects of personality are always interacting within a person to influence his or her personality and behavior. For example, the id might yell, I'm hungry, I need to eat right now. And the super ego yells back, you can't, we're in the middle of class. And then the ego offers a compromise, drink some water, chew a stick of gum, and then go eat after class is done. According to Freud, this power struggle can also lead to unhealthy behaviors and neuroses, a tendency to experience negative emotions. For example, an overpowered id might lead to impulsivity, while an underpowered id might lead someone to deny their needs. A dominant superego could lead to crippling guilt, while a weak one could lead to selfish and cruel behavior. Small imbalances could lead to the infamous Freudian slips, where repressed unconscious urges can sometimes surface through a slip of the tongue, like saying, I'm sad you're here, when you intended to say I'm glad you're here to a visiting aunt who pinches your cheeks too hard. When larger imbalances occur, people try to handle the resulting anxiety with defense mechanisms, unconscious, sometimes unhealthy behaviors intended to reduce anxiety and protect ourselves from discomfort. Some of these defense mechanisms are helpful, like sublimation, or redirecting our socially unacceptable desires into socially appropriate behavior like handling your aggressive desires by enrolling in a martial arts class. Others, such as denial, or refusing to accept unpleasant events as real, can lead to a problematic distortion of reality. Other defense mechanisms, like displacement, or transferring inappropriate urges onto a safer target, can be harder to classify as good or bad. They could involve you hitting a pillow instead of your friend, which isn't the healthiest behavior, but it is still fine, but it could also involve yelling at a child after being humiliated by your boss, which I think we would all agree is not fine. Which defense mechanism we use depends on many factors, such as the behaviors that we've seen modeled for us, or what has been successful for us in the past, or even what kind of anxiety is being produced by the unresolved conflict. In addition to the development of the id, ego, and superego, Freud also believed that children went through a series of developmental stages, and that failure to resolve conflicts at each of these developmental stages could result in habits and behaviors expressed when we reach adulthood, everything from smoking to obsessing about cleanliness. Freud believed that during each of these stages, the id produces a pleasure-seeking urge that corresponds to a different part of the body, called erogenous zones. These zones also give us the names of each of the five stages of psychosexual development, oral, anal, phallic, latency, 
or a time between stages, and genital. Freud believed that an individual must shift through each of these stages, and in this particular order, in order to develop a healthy adult personality. The shift in zones during development is driven by the libido, or the energy generated by our sexual and survival instincts. This energy drives the urges of the id at each stage, which leads to pushback from the superego, and the resulting conflict, and our resolving it, moves us through the developmental stages. But importantly, if a person does not resolve the conflicts at a given stage, they will become fixated or stuck at this stage, which has a huge impact on our adult personality. The first stage is the oral stage, which lasts from birth to about one year of age. In this stage, pleasure is focused on the mouth, and so the infant receives satisfaction through things like feeding and pacifiers and sucking one's thumb. The conflict at this stage arises when the infant is weaned and moves from milk or formula to solid food. So they need to let go of the oral pleasures as they knew them in order to adapt to the reality of the adult world. This process is stressful to the infant, but they adapt with time. However, if this process doesn't go smoothly, the result could be an oral fixation, which could be seen in adult behaviors like smoking, drinking, overeating, or nail biting to reduce anxiety. The next stage is the anal stage, which lasts from one to three. In this stage, the conflict focuses on our desire to pee and defecate at will and the reality of potty training. Freud believed that parents who push too hard or too early could later cause an individual to become obsessed with neatness and organization, while not enough focus on it could lead to adult behaviors like messiness and carelessness. The phallic stage, lasting from age three to age six, is when Freud believed that children become aware of the physical differences between boys and girls, and as a result, begin to feel a desire for the opposite sex parent and jealousy towards the same sex parent. Called the Oedipus Complex for boys and the Electra Complex for girls, this conflict is resolved when the child realizes that aligning with the same sex parent indirectly brings them closer to the opposite sex parent. A failure to shift this alignment would lead to jealousy, overambition, and attention-seeking in adult behavior. From there, Freud believed that children reach a relatively stable period called latency, where their urges are quiet and the child is able to develop in other ways, focusing on school, hobbies, and friends. However, things are thrown into disorder again when the child reaches puberty and enters the genital stage, where there is a sexual awakening or reawakening, but instead of being focused on our parents, it's redirected to socially acceptable partners who often resemble our opposite sex parents, Freud's words, not mine. A failure to manage these desires into adulthood could lead to impotence and unsatisfying relationships. At this point, you might have a lot of questions like, why did Freud focus so much on sex? Or what about children that only have a single parent? Or what about gay people who aren't even attracted to the opposite sex? These are all good questions, and it helps to understand why Freud's theory, everything from the id, ego, and superego to his five stages of development, don't really align with our modern understanding of the brain and behavior. But with that said, Freud's view of the mind has had profound influence on the field of psychology, the idea of an unconscious mind, or that our adult selves could be influenced by past traumas and painful memories, the idea that childhood experiences could shape our personality and behavior at all. This is all part of the extensive legacy that Freud has created.